And we're recording. Tracy Alloway, thanks for being on Fitness and Consciousness. Thanks for having me, Ryan. I'm really excited about this and all the work that you're doing, too. Oh, thanks. Um, so I found you on Instagram. A, a buddy of mine, I, I guess you popped up because a buddy of mine, Joey Lavelle, likes a lot of um, uh, your post. And so I started looking more into you. And um, you're doing a lot of interesting things. So you're, you teach uh, like psychology, right? And you're primarily interested in memory. And yeah. Then professor of psychology and one of my areas of research interest is something called working memory which is kind of like your brain's active memory um, and so I've done a lot of uh, research looking specifically at how we use working memory in the classroom in the workplace and even from a fitness perspective as well yeah I actually um, have your book here that's fantastic and, um, I'm, only on, I'm only on page 20 I just I just got it but, <laughs> so I don't know if I was familiar with it being called working memory before, but I said I'm only on page 20 and I haven't flipped around very much in it. It was like you have like these kinds of memories stored in different places and then your working memory is the thing that goes and gets it, kind of yes. like gets it off the shelf or is that like, or if you could explain like what is working memory compared to like what does it actually do? What is it? Sure. Well, working memory is kind of like your brain's conductor. So if you think of an orchestra or a symphony, you have all the musicians, you have the violins, you have the brass and the strings and so on. And the conductor's up in the front and he doesn't actually play any music, but he brings everything together. So he says, it's your turn, your turn and so on. And that's a little bit of what working memory does in our brain. So working memory actually is in the front of our brain in a part of the brain known as the prefrontal cortex. And as it's up there, when you're using your working memory, you use Using it, for example, in a job interview. Your working memory is the conductor that goes to your, your hippocampus, your long-term memory, and says, hey, I read this fact about this company. I'm going to pull it out and use it right now as I answer this question. If you're a student and you're studying for an exam, it's your working memory that goes back again in your long-term memory and says, oh, I remember reading this in chapter five. I'm going to pull this information out and use it right here. We also see a working memory is used for emotional regulation, how we manage our emotions. And it works with another part of our brain called the amygdala, um, sometimes known as our emotional hub or center of the brain. And so working memory that kind of says, okay, a little softer now, or yeah, now we can get excited and so on. So our working memory is really like our brain's conductor pulling all of these different parts of the brain together. Yeah, I found it interesting because Oh, sorry, your uh, like video was a little off there for a second. Um, I didn't interrupt you, did I? No, no, okay. you're good. Um, yeah, I was like reading and um, like the guy was like uh, asked a question and he would, and it was like, so it was like an under pressure kind of thing where so if you're like under pressure, you're not going to be thinking of um like like stuff that doesn't matter like what color your car is or something like that like if you're under um, some kind of stress like you know, like something has to happen immediately or like it's like the job interview so like, what is it that shuts out what's not important and allows you to like focus on so the working memory just are certain things getting shut off and or what's the Other question so if we talk about it in the context of sports since i you know i know a lot of the work you do is fitness related. If you think about someone who's an athlete or a sportsman, that whole idea of choking under pressure, even if you're thinking of test anxiety, like taking a math exam or performing at an important tournament or championship, if, if your working memory has to do two things, if it has to think of what you need to do as well as manage your stress and anxiety for that event, it can get overloaded. It's juggling too many balls. And so that's why when we talk about sports, we actually say it's better to learn not using your working memory. And there's an important reason for that. If we learn using our muscle memory rather than our working memory, then our muscles learn to just kind of automatically know what to do. It's like when you pick up a pencil, you automatically know, yeah, here's how I need to write. You don't actually have to use your working memory as an adult to think, do I close my fingers over the pencil? Do I hold it this way? What do I need to do? All of that is already automatic in our muscle memory. And it's the same thing if you're learning a new skill, whether it's tennis or golf or something that involves what was skiing. And uh, in my case, as I talk about in the book, if you turn off your working memory and let your muscles just kind of feel what you need to do, 
that's a great way to learn because then your muscles make that, that movement automatic. And when you're in a time of stress, so even, you know, as I, as the example that was given in the book, I'm, I'm obviously not a champion skier, but skiing under pressure may be icy conditions or something that when you're a beginner skier and all these things may, may make you more stressed, your working memory is free to say, hey, let's manage the stress. I can look out for the patch of snow that's not icy, or I can, you know, manage the crowd over here that may be cheering too loudly or whatever that stress or source of anxiety may be. But if your working memory has been the uh, recipient where you learned that physical activity, then you're also thinking, well, do I hold my racket this way? Do I stand this way? What do I need to do? And it's too much for your working memory to keep all of that in mind. And that's why one of the great tips is when you're learning sports, and this is something substantiated by research in multiple studies, whether it's tennis, it's golf, or uh, you know, other more, it's soccer and so on. When you turn off your working memory, when you're actually learning that sport and let your muscles take charge and, and, and uh, automatize all of those muscle movements, your working memory is free to help you manage that stress and anxiety. So you end up performing better. So you're able to like go with the, the, the flow or get in like flow state because you're not like worried about all these other things. Um, yeah, in part. It's kind of take over and say, hey, I know what I'm doing. You know, working memory, you just take care of the stress, but my whole club or whatever that might be. Yeah, I was, uh, um, I'm going to hit pause for a second. Okay, we're recording again. Okay. All right. Um, so I, can you uh, finish your, like, that last, like, 30 seconds because the, the video was kind of cutting out a little bit? Yeah, sure. Well, so the flow state. Are- Thing is that there's a substantial body of research to show that when we learn a sports movement by turning down a working memory and actually letting a muscle memory take charge, then we have a working memory free to manage any stress and anxiety. So it makes us much better performers because we're not constantly thinking of how to use our working memory to, you know, think, do I hold my racket this way? Do I hold my club this way? And so on. Our working memory is free just to think, this is stressful. How can I manage this? And so on. And yeah, that. That makes sense. And what I was thinking of, like, uh, I was trying to think of what to ask you. And like, sometimes I'll uh, describe, uh, like when I'm sending out like the podcast invitations, I might say it's like, it's a conversation format rather than an interview. Yeah. Meaning like, um, I don't, I did have like, I wrote down a a few things to ask you about, but I more generally have different directions I want to go. I want to talk to you about like movement and different things, but I didn't have a specific movement question written out and because kind of what I've found is sometimes if uh, if people if I just have a list of these 20 questions I ask one I'm waiting for you to get done and then I'll ask this one and then yeah. I'll wait for you to get done and I'll ask number three and I might miss what you're saying uh, where that I could pick up on something that you're alluding to um, but also I can be more in in the moment and really listen to what you're saying. And then I can be like, Oh, that actually reminds me of uh, this story. And then I tell you a, a short story of what happened to me or a friend of mine or something. And then that reminds you of something else that you weren't planning on talking about. Like, Oh yeah. When I was a kid, I used to do this or something like that. And then some people will all just kind of, uh, they answer a story instead of a question. They answer a, so I'm, as I'm learning this craft of being a podcast host and what, how do I make this like really the best show possible? I'm seeing like that that's really an interesting way and people seem like pick up on it and they will say like the, the word organic an organic nature of it and, and that kind of thing. Uh, I was, so I was talk, thinking of like the, the stream of consciousness. Yeah. So maybe um, like when you were like thinking of what you might want to talk about for this show or next one, you weren't thinking about, like riding uh, big wheels when you were a little kid or something like that. But maybe I, I sparked that and then, oh, that just triggered this memory. And then now you can talk about riding big wheels if you did ride big wheels when you were a little kid. So like what causes that? So how, how are you able to, like what's going on in the mind that allows you to, um, you didn't like have to like sit down and like think out these different stories of riding big wheels when you were a kid. But just me saying that, it's like, oh, and then you're able to go on this five-minute 
stream of consciousness about whatever subject it is. So is that the working memory thing or is that something different or, or what's what's going on when? It is something different. And when you were talking about it, it really reminded me a lot of what happens in studies of creativity and jazz musicians. So jazz musicians are doing a lot of how you describe. They don't really sit down with a structured, here's my piece, here's my composition, I'm gonna go through these different bars to create this melody. They're kind of riffing, it's coming, it's, you know, it's, they're just kind of working off each other, going back and forth, much like you described with this kind of storytelling type of format. And what um, researchers have found is when they look at the brain, what's going on, there are two really important things that are happening. The first thing that is happening is that our working memory is turned down a little bit. And the second thing that is happening is the part of the brain that is activating our self-awareness or sort of sort of subconscious part of our brain, that's being uh, amplified a little bit. And I think that's what's happening here when you, when you look at people who are highly creative, in this case, they were jazz musicians in the study, but they're kind of amping up their, their self-awareness, that introspection, and they're saying, hey, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I'm gonna go with, and that's what's coming out. So it's not structured, it's not formatted, and that's where, that's a source of creativity. And in fact, a, a long-standing agreed upon definition for creativity among psychologists and so on is this idea of divergent thinking, that you have the set way of thinking, and then if you consider someone creative, they think divergently or differently from that set, and that, you know, think of jazz musician, of this kind of back and forth that we're talking about. And that part of the brain is also in the front of the brain in the frontal cortex, but it's more related to our introspection or self-awareness and self-expression, really. Yeah, it's really interesting how it works. I've seen um, you play piano. Um, <laughs> on, <and> I, <laughs> yeah, I, I um, heard some of it. You're, you're really good. When, when did you start playing? Oh, when I was young, when I was seven, but a lot of what I play is exactly that. I've just made it up on the spot. I don't have any, you know, set composition. It's more really just what am I feeling right now? What kind of notes do I want to play? Um, and it's, you know, it's a nice change from playing a structured piece too. So. Yeah, I play guitar and I'm, I learned in, I started playing when I was 13. I'm 39 now. And I, I can play some cool stuff, but I kind of learned in a, in a weird way, not real structured. Here's your scales and modes and all that kind of stuff. I, I kind of learned just by playing, uh, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's like playing a song. I want to learn a song, so yeah. I'd, I'd play it. But I didn't, so I, my music theory was like kind of off. So now I'm like kind of going back mm -hmm. and I started using a uh, musician. Okay. It's a, uh, um, are you familiar with it? It's like this mm -hmm. subscription. It's like nine ninety nine a month. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like starting at the, at the beginning. I don't care if I've been playing for almost, 25 years or whatever I'm like start I'm trying to get like this more structured approach instead of yeah. um because uh, I think that'll help because I kind of got in this like rut so yeah. when, you're, when you're able to just uh um kind of like play what you feel yeah you're using this and your your knowledge of the brain like you're talking about like the flow mm -hmm. so when you I guess uh trying to say like uh like how do you get better at it i guess is what i'm what i'm trying to get to like how do you get better at just um as a musician going with the flow yeah what you feel, I think, feel. so i think as a musician a couple things have to happen first you need to have some residual uh, knowledge wh whether it's like for yourself in the case of guitar whether it's knowing that these are the chords that are going to work together whether it's one four five chords to make up a song or you know what what the minor chords are of the of the major and so on whether it's that you know the finger placement obviously having that skill automatized makes it easier to turn off your working memory and get into that flow state especially with music so imagine if you're trying to play a song and for me, for the piano, for example, if I'm trying to play a song and all I can think about is where's my C, you know, where do I put my fingers now? It's hard to kind of uh, uh, be automatized in my playing when I'm constantly thinking of where my finger placement should be. It's the same with, you know, whether you're playing a brass instrument up here or whether you're playing a guitar for the chords and so on. So I think the first step is to be able to automatize the kind of skill. So even if all you know is three chords, that's great. 
just focus on those three chords and then let yourself kind of let your fingers be automatized and, and change your plucking or change you know your strumming or whatever that might be and help let that help you achieve more of that flow state and it's turning off turning off that part of the brain um to allow yourself to be more introspective rather than that working memory dominant part so some Quick ways to do that are to, if you want to be more creative in your musical composition, is to do that when your brain is tired, when your working memory is tired. So then your working memory isn't tempted to kind of sneak in and say, hey, I remember reading, this is how we should play this song, or this is what we should do with our fingers. You want it to be completely automatized and so that your feeling really, if you will, your musical feeling is taking over. So if you're, you know, if you're sort of tired before bed and you're thinking, I can't do anything else, maybe that's a good time to pick up the guitar and start strumming. Another way to do that would be maybe to overload your working memory intentionally. So when you're playing the guitar, when you're playing the piano, you could try counting backwards from 100 by the sixes. So you go 94, 88, 82. So that's a great way that researchers find that can actually overload working memory. And they find that it's very difficult for people to do another cognitively demanding task when your working memory is overloaded by counting backwards like that. So you can count backwards and then start strumming. And it may be a little tricky at first, but you may realize that your music is flowing a bit better because your working memory isn't kind of, you know, interjecting and saying, hey, you should do it this way. So that, those would be a couple of tips that we can use to turn down a working memory so that we can turn up that self-reflection. And it's part of the medial frontal cortex. That's where the uh, research is found when they were looking at these jazz musicians. Um, so we want to turn that up and turn our prefrontal uh, cortex up. Uh, that's, that's really amazing. I've never, I've never heard of that before. Sometimes when you're playing, I mean, I would kind of keep time like naturally, but I might be off a little bit. Now that I'm like going this computerized thing, sometimes I'm a little early, I'm a little late. And so it's kind of interesting other than my like internal clock that's, I usually play by myself. So um, I don't really know if I'm, you know, slightly off. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, like counting backwards when I'm trying to, when I'm trying to like uh, improv or play something that's, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'd never, never really heard of that before. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about like, uh, your fitness and I've seen your, and how that affects memory and you're doing like, uh, aerial. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff, I mean, like running my and, my silks are right next to me over here. <laughs> and, um, uh, like yoga and you're doing a lot of like barefoot stuff. So like, how does that all, how does that help your memory? Yeah, so I, you know, as a psychologist, I kind of like to know if, if these, some of these ideas can actually be tested and what they show. So one of the big studies that we did at the university um, with some runners was to actually see if barefoot running may make a difference to working memory, if there's that kind of two-way street. And really the reason behind that is because when you know, would be running on the beach, you have to, and you take your shoes off, it just felt a lot better. And you realize that you have to pay so much more attention so you don't get, you know, I live a couple blocks from the beach and you don't want to step on a, a, a shell or, or something else. And so you, you're kind of keeping track. And I realized that before when I would do a road run with shoes, I would turn my mind off, I would just kind of zone out, a lot of runners talk about that, and just, you know, kind of forget about what I'm actually running and let my mind kind of work through stuff. And, but when I was running on the beach, I was far more attentive to where my feet were, where I was and everything. And I wanted to know if this was actually making any kind of difference to working memory. So we tested this with a group of runners. We made sure that all of them could run two miles in a sitting without you know, feeling too tired or exhausted. And we had them run in four different ways. The first two ways, they were running barefoot. But what we did is we used an indoor track and we put chips, like poker chips on the ground to kind of simulate this idea of running barefoot outside where they actually had to land on the poker chips like a safe spot. So imagine if you're running in a park or uh, on a beach and again, you want to avoid some shells or some sticks that are, or pebbles or whatever. So you want to find a safe spot for your feet. So the poker chips were simulating the safe spot. So they ran barefoot with the poker chips on the track and then without any poker chips on the track. And they came back another day and they ran with shoes also with poker chips and without poker chips. We measured their heart rate, we measured their self-selected pace. Uh, we worked with someone um, who's an exercise physiologist just to kind of look at all of these other physical factors that are going on when you're running to see if, you know, if you're running too fast or too slow, does that affect how your barefoot or being uh, wearing shoes can affect what the impact might have on memory. So we were able to control for a lot of these other factors that can contribute to the effect of exercise on the brain. 
And here's what we found. We found three really interesting things. We found that the time, uh, first of all, we found that it mattered whether you ran with shoes or without. We found that it was only when people were running. So it's the same people running with shoes and without shoes. And we found it was only when they ran without their shoes, when they ran barefoot, that their working memory improved by over 20%. So that was really interesting. So the same runners, even when they were running with shoes, didn't show any benefit to working memory. The second thing that we found was the time mattered that they had to run at least around 16 minutes or so. So if they ran less than that, if they ran about eight minutes, we didn't see any benefit to working memory. So, and this kind of goes to the idea that other researchers have demonstrated that when you run, you release more oxygen to the brain, especially your prefrontal cortex, which we were talking about. And so that allows your working memory to function more efficiently. So we know that that time may have allowed more oxygen to come to the brain, improving our working memory. And the third thing that we found is that Barefoot running only improved working memory when they were running with the chips on the ground. So you actually had to focus on what you were running on. So let's say you wanted to run barefoot on a treadmill. There's nothing really, you know, that you have to worry about in a treadmill. Nothing's going to poke your feet or hurt you and so on. So you may tune out. And if you're not attending to where your feet are being placed, there's no opportunity for working memory to get that workout as well. So we found that with our runners, it was when they ran barefoot for 16 minutes and only when they were actually focusing on these little poker chips to the ground that we saw the benefits of working memory. And you know, think about it, 16 minutes, you can see a 20, over 20% improvement to working memory. That could be really great if you have a big presentation that day or an exam that you want to be sharp and focused for. Yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. So it kind of happened naturally if you're like out in the, out in the woods or something and you're barefoot, then um, you'd naturally be like looking out for all the sharp stuff and yeah it does so i wonder about like the you know the the real science behind some of it because they talk about like earthing and you know like sure. neg negative ions and yeah like is that real do, do you like look into that um, we didn't in our study, and I know, I mean, I know that people are starting to look at some of these emergent ideas and how, you know, how reliable and whether or not we can replicate that. In my own research, I was, another study that we had done was looking at something called natural movement. So again, when you're out in the woods, if you're climbing, you're doing these bear crawls, and we compared three different groups of people, people that were engaging in these natural movements, and that's a big thing people are you know, some people are wanting to move away from the gym, but still wanting to be active. So they want to be outside doing things that we used to do as kids in the playground, you know, those monkey bars going along them as fast as we can. So I wanted to know if that kind of movement might also have a benefit to working memory. So I compared a group of people doing that for over an hour. I compared a group of people doing um, yoga, a stationary form of yoga called Hatha Yoga for the same amount of time. And then I compared a third group that were learning new information. So they were cognitively stimulated, but they were sitting down the whole time for about an hour and a half. So I could see these three different groups of people, which of them might show improvements to working memory. And we could kind of figure out, was it if you're being cognitively stimulated that you would see improvements to your working memory? Is it just the fact that you are being what we call proprioceptively aware? So you're aware of your body's position in space, which is what yoga teaches. Could that be beneficial to working memory? Or is it something like natural movement where we suggest that if you are aware of your body's position, but you're also dynamic. So you're proprioceptively aware, but you're moving, you're bear crawling, you're holding on to a branch or a monkey bar. So you're constantly engaging and involving your working memory in each next movement that you're making. And we saw that it was that natural movement type of activities that showed again about a 22% improvement to working memory. And these were adults, you know, some is, you know, up from 20 to 60 years of age. So we're, it was encouraging to see that this kind of benefits are across the board in adulthood. That's really fascinating. I'm actually uh, in the process of organizing a workshop with uh, like seven other instructors. And uh, my kind of my rule for it was no equipment. So oh, we're just going to be you. doing... Um, like uh, a lot of them can do like animal movements, like capoeira, yoga. Um, yeah. And that was kind of like my thing. I was like, all right. So they had like some of them before. Um, we've done two other ones with like the similar kind of, we have all, they're not just helping me do what I'm saying. They're yeah. doing whatever they want. I choose them because they're really awesome instructors. It's like, I want you to do whatever you feel like doing. Mm -hmm. And this time my only like little hitch was this time, no equipment. Mm -hmm. And so we'll do, um, probably outside, teach at a wilderness survival school. 
And Amazing. So, um, it'll Amazing. be like a lot of that stuff. So I might have to do uh, like some, um, like quote you in some of the advertising or something. So I can talk about like working. Yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. And you know, if you want to, if you want to give them a quick working memory test before they begin the training, and then again at the end of the training to see what kind of improvement they're having as a result of your course, I'd love to be part of that too. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to. I'll, yeah, I'll I'll talk to you more about that. I, I would love to to figure that out. That would be really cool. It's the last yeah. se last weekend of September that we're doing it. That would be really fascinating how it, yeah. how it's going to work. So it's going to be like meditation stuff so i'm going to get into like zen meditation teach the microcosmic orbit if you're familiar with that and mm -hmm. so we're kind of getting into like some uh, deeper stuff but what you said a little bit ago about the, the proprioception mm -hmm. um i saw that you were in iceland doing like a virtual reality thing yes you're, yeah you're so, talking about yeah go ahead <laughs> um yeah i was just gonna ask you about that like what you, you're talking about uh, proprioception and working memory. And then so that's what kind of made me think of it. You're like the these natural movements, and then you're in this. That was fascinating because with a colleague of mine, what, uh, sorry, say it again? No, go ahead. Oh, um, yeah, that's really a fascinating piece of research I'm doing with a collaborator out in Iceland where we're looking at the impact of virtual reality in um, dealing with trauma. So how people can actually work through their trauma using these proprioception uh, aspects of virtual reality. And so we know that when people are working through phobias, there's a lot of research to show that if they're not able to work through their phobias by actually being in that situation, so let's say you have a fear of heights, and it's too overwhelming for them to actually be in that um, uh, kind of height type of environment, then virtual reality is really effective in helping them manage that. So we wanted to kind of take that and look at that in the context of uh, childhood trauma and how it might affect us as adults. And so um, we're replicating these different scenes and getting people to talk about it within the context of the virtual reality. So it's the uh, early stages of the study where we're you know, collecting data right now, but it's very exciting to know that that can have an impact too as well. Yeah, that makes sense because like when we have like phobias isn't it like the common thing we um like if you're really afraid of spiders or heights like for, for heights we'll just step on this thing that's a foot tall and then yeah. like go up higher and then you just kind of like face the fear and that's the how it's um so like what kind of environments are you talking about is it like driving a car like maybe they were in a car wreck so they're afraid to get in a car or what kind of environments are, are you studying yeah, so similar to that, so we're also, what they're doing is that they're actually able to take from the camera, taking photos of that kind of environment that the individual has experienced trauma in, and then implement that into the virtual environment. So it can actually be tailored to the individual. So for example, if they're saying like, like you mentioned, this is the car accident, this is the street that it happened in, they're able to go grab a screenshot of that street and create that virtual environment where they can now move back through that environment so they don't have that anticipatory anxiety. So by the time to phobia, it's the anticipation that leads to the anxiety that, oh my gosh, I have to go on a hike, I can't, it's high. And it's actually that anticipation that leads to that anxiety and so that virtual reality can help work through that anticipatory anxiety obviously before you actually get to the event because you know that you know, you're just standing in a room, there's actually nothing around you. It's, you have someone talking you through it at all times too. So they're, they're working, their programmers are working to capture the images of the individual's experiences and then implement that into the environment. Well, that's, that's really amazing. So it's, it's still in the experimental stages, they're not really putting it out for common clinical use yet? No, not yet. It's still just being investigated. <laughs> We're still working on that. Yeah, it sounds like the theory is there though, right? Like the, or the concept or however you, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but it sounds like the, the concept is already kind of proven, but just not in that context. Is that? Yeah, it's just not widely delivered as much. And so we just want to continue replicating those findings. But uh, clinicians do you sometimes use that even with amputees where they can create a virtual, if let's say they've lost an arm, they can create a virtual arm and they can actually see themselves moving that missing limb. And people have reported experiencing tremendous release of stress, of anger even, um, and being able to sleep better just from a number of sessions of virtual reality from MPT. So there's a lot of research looking at virtual reality, not just from you know, the cognitive or the clinical perspective, but even in the medical field and how losing limbs can affect us psychologically. There's other researchers that are doing that kind of work too. So lots of fascinating stuff with virtual reality. 
Yeah, you're talking about anxiety, and I, I see a lot of um, like Facebook posts or like it seems like just anxiety is a, a major problem for for people now, and um, like like if, if someone just has I don't know much about it really because to me it's like maybe I just don't, I just don't get it. Like, why, why can't you just like deal with whatever this thing is? Mm -hmm. But like for some people, it's just like really de debilitating. Like they, like those, like say it's like a, like if you're about to like tip back in your chair, if you're just leaning back in your chair and it's, and then you feel like you're about to like really fall. And then like that, that second, they say it's kind of like that, but they're just like stuck there. Yeah. So do you, is there like from like, besides like a, a trauma, is there work like other solutions for more like general anxiety or is like all anxiety from some kind of a trauma or, or what? what yeah, could well, in fact, I've done some work looking at things like uh, test anxiety. So you have generalized anxiety disorder, which you know can affect you across the board and that tends to be far more debilitating. It can actually affect your everyday functioning in life. But then you have social anxiety where some people are I'm able to manage it where they may feel nervous about giving a presentation, but still, you know, kind of manage some of the symptoms. And a lot of times that would be some physical symptoms like your heart is beating faster, your, your palms are sweaty, you're sweating more generally, um, your stomach, you know, you have that kind of weird feeling in the pit of your stomach. So those are some of the physical symptoms associated with um, social anxiety that, you know, that being around people may cause you to feel those kinds of symptoms. And that's a lot easier to work with than obviously you have test anxiety where you can have the similar physical symptoms that I've described but related to a test whether it's math or, or science or any kind of examination. Now we see that with working memory, your working memory is actually average in those types of instances but what happens is that your anxiety means that you, use that, um, you have less space because that anxiety takes up so much of your space. So again, think of a performer when you have to perform you have so much stress to, to kind of manage and your working memory has to focus on what do I need to play and what do I need to you know, act out here versus I have to manage all the stress as well. And so that can, that can be overwhelming as well. So can you, could we pause just for a second and let me grab some water? Is that okay, Ryan? Okay, we're back on. Okay. Um, did you want to, uh, were, you, was your, were you finished with that th thought then with the anxiety or? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I mean, other than the only thing to mention is that there is a difference between trait anxiety, which is something more stable, something that you're born with, and some people are naturally more anxious than others, um, or state anxiety, where something very specific in your environment acts like a trigger, like social anxiety or test anxiety. So it may be that you're not generally an anxious person, but you have this a trigger, whether it's public speaking or a math exam, that's specifically bringing on these ang uh, anxious symptoms. So. So if it's more like the, the general, it doesn't seem to be anything specific, then um, I, don't, I don't think you just answered, but like what, like what can you do to, is there a solution to like exercises people can do if it doesn't seem to be anything, they just have a, a panic attack all of a sudden or an anxiety attack or whatever the. Yeah, so a lot of times clinicians suggest that you can detect the symptoms early and then try to you know, either meditate or engage in some deep breathing or close your eyes and focus on something positive or an image that's positive. Some people that are very uh, sensorial, so they like touching something, they may want to have a, a bracelet or something that they touch or something in their pocket that they hold on to that might give them comfort and they're associated with the source of comfort. So there are things like that, that when you feel like my, my heart's starting to pound a little faster, I'm feeling a little sweaty, those kinds of Early, early detection so the individual can begin to manage their own symptoms. Another approach that some people use is to induce those symptoms, so make you breathe extra fast, you know, to kind of uh, get that fast breathing or, or help, you know, get you sweating and so on to let you see that you can actually uh, dissociate the physical symptomology from how, what's actually causing that. So you can say, look, your heart's going to be faster, but that doesn't mean that you have to feel anxious about this event. So that's a technique that a lot of times um, clinicians use as well, is trying to work through the physical symptoms to let the individual know that it's not a problem, it's going to be okay, your heart beating faster isn't necessarily a sign that something negative is going to happen. And then we can work through the sort of cognitive piece of why exactly you're feeling anxious.
Yeah, it just seems like I, I just see like more and more of that. Like it just seems to be such a, a common thing for people for, for some reason, um, especially women maybe. Is it like, is it like more in women than? Uh, generalized anxiety tends to have a higher intense effect women more than men. Um, social anxiety tends to affect men more than women. So you do see some differences in males and females depending on the type of anxiety. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had a kind of a little change of direction here, but like, what about like past life memory? Have you looked into that? Um, no, I mean, there is some research on hypnosis to kind of bring up repressed memories or sometimes I have done some work on what uh, research is called false memories, where mm. we can be pretty certain that we remembered something that happened when actually that wasn't the case. Um, so we, there is a lot of research to say that people, and, and that doesn't, that's not necessarily related to past life, but just to say that memories in general are somewhat elusive in that we tend to be very confident that we've remembered something, but it's not always accurate. And so to give you a couple examples, there is a fascinating study where people um, asked uh, some college students with their permission to give them childhood photographs. And they spoke to their parents about them just to say, hey, uh, this is Susie's uh, fifth birthday party. And then what they did is that they photoshopped the dog or something in the image. And they would say, Susie, do you remember when that dog jumped up and ate your birthday cake? And of course, this doesn't never happen. But Susie is convinced that that happened too. So you can implant false memories too. It's very common. And in fact, there was a legal case, I think a few years ago, where a father sued a psychiatrist for implanting false memories of trauma in his daughter um, that, you know, that they found that that. He, he had never, he was never the perpetrator of that trauma um, and that, that uh, under the session with the psychiatrist, those memories had been implanted. So you can see that even in a kind of typical college type of population, these um, experiments, these researchers were able to implement it and implant, excuse me, these false memories about birthday parties and whatnot. And, and, and when they recalled it, the uh, college students were very confident. They said, oh gosh, I remember that dog. What a problem. My whole birthday party was ruined because my cake was eaten by this dog. And even though, you know, none of that had actually happened. So um, I think it's, it's tricky when you start talking about aspects like false memory, past life memories that you brought up, because it's, there's no way to verify how reliable those memories are. But, you know, we can't actually say, yeah, this happened or this didn't happen. And we can't look at confidence because people tend to be highly confident that this absolutely happened to them. Yeah, I've seen where um, people will admit that they committed a crime and they, they didn't, and, but they, or... Yeah, the false memory thing, it just kind of makes you wonder, like, how much of what I, I think of what I've done for the past 39 years it was even real. <laughs> uh, Sounds like a Matrix conversation right now, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, a, weird, uh, a weird sort of, sort of thing. Um, well, and, and I think in part it's because of how we store memories. So when, we, when we're young children and we're developing language, we have what's called a very literal uh, encoding of memories. We, we kind of say, well, A happened, then B happened, then C happened, then D happened. And then we've constructed that event in our mind. But as we get older, it's not very efficient to remember A, B, C, D for every single event because you know we're getting older, we're, we're not you know six years old, seven years old. So around that time point, is when you see a switch in how we begin to store our memories. We no longer go with the sequence of ABC and we engage in what's called just memory. So we, we say, instead of ABCD happened, we say A happened. I generally know that if A happens, B, C, and D also happen. So if I just remember A happened, it's very likely that B, C, and D happened as well. So to give you an example, you could say, you know, when I was five years old, I ate ice cream. It was very hot. I um, I went to the pool and I was sweating. So there's your A, B, C, and D. So as a young child, again, young meaning under seven typically, um, you remember all of those four factors because you're still building up your knowledge of the world. You're not fully certain, your brain isn't fully encoded that those four things typically happen together. And as you get older, you see a pattern. You say, okay, when it's hot, it's going to have ice cream. And I do sweat. Sometimes I go to the pool as well too when it's hot. So you have these four events. And then as you get older, so maybe at 10 years old, you have a memory of eating ice cream. You just remember A. And you think, well, if I ate ice cream, yeah, I probably went to the pool that day too. And it probably was very hot and I probably was sweating. So that our memory kind of shifts the way in which we store our memories, shifts from remembering all that specific detail to a gist-based memory that 
the kind of overall idea of memory. And that's why it's easy for false memories to occur because at 10, maybe I did eat ice cream, but maybe it was winter and it was this new ice cream store that opened in the mall and everyone was lining up to try it, but none of those other three events happened. But because of the way our memory stores seem to just as we get older, it's easy to implant and say, oh, that store probably opened this summer because everyone eats ice cream in the summer. So you've, you've got this schema, if you will, that makes more sense. You think, oh yeah, yeah, you're probably right. That, yeah, it was a summer, a summer memory. So it's easy for that reason to implant these false memories. Yeah, and what about like when um, like a crime happens and all the witnesses, they, they give a different account of what happened. They're not, they're trying to be honest, but oh, I heard uh, four gunshots. It was crazy. Somebody else, it was, there was like seven gunshots. Someone else, there was only one gunshot, but so all these different, like what's happening in that, in that moment that's, that has everybody so wrong about what actually happened. Yeah, and that's called selective attention. Well, two things, actually. The first is selective attention, that we tend to remember what we focused our attention on. So maybe, you know, if, uh, if you're a parent, you may be more focused on, the, you know, were they children? Is it safe? So you may not be counting the gunshots. You may be looking for a place to hide. Mm -hmm. And so when someone asks you how many gunshots, it's not encoded. So clearly we feel you have to give an answer. So it's not that you're lying. You, you generally think, yeah, I think I generally heard five gunshots. But really, your attention was focused on where's the quickest exit that I can get out of here. Now, if it was um, you know, someone else that was just bought a new car and was wondering, hey, is my car going to be OK? Their selective attention is focused on which road can I take to get my car, you know, me and my car out of here. So again, they may be focused on something else. So when it comes time to recall the event, they have only attended to one piece of that information. And the second reason why our memory for these kinds of criminal events aren't that uh, clear is because, sorry, I think I'm saying Can you still see me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry, my popped up, my battery thing popped up. But um, the second reason that we sometimes don't remember criminal events or these kinds of events so clearly is because of emotion, something called flash bulb memories, where with a strong heightened emotion, we just bam, we, that emotion kind of overtakes us, the amygdala, like I was talking about earlier, the emotional. Uh, hub of the brain takes over and our working memory isn't really uh, on its game. Like we're not ready to encode all the information because our emotional center is kind of at high alert thinking what's going on, what's going on. And this is very common. Like even when people report events that happen after an earthquake, they're convinced that that earthquake happened, uh, you know, at eight in the morning when they're in bed and their alarm had gone off and all of a sudden they go to bed with but in fact, there's actually reports to say that earthquake happened at three in the afternoon. There's, you know, there's no way they would be in bed ready to start their work day. So, but because of the emotion, our flashbulb memories make that that impression very vivid and very believable in our mind. But our emotion has taken over, so we're not actually encoding the facts as they really happen. Yeah, it's really, really bizarre how how that all how that all works and what. So, like, memory is has to do with like your name in these different parts of the brain so um, the is like almost like the whole brain has something to do with your memory like depending on what kind of memory it is or like yes yeah, if, if I'm in a yeah so a hippocampus you know that uh, that's in the temporal lobe that part relates to long-term memory, like you're talking about this big library where we remember things that happened to us, our, our autobiographical memories, your know, childhood memories, college memories, and so on. Um, it also is the storehouse for facts, multiplication tables, uh, you know, uh, states and capitals and so on. All of this is in our, in our hippocampus, in our temporal lobe. But then you have your amygdala where we have our emotional memories and that gets bundled up too, where we connect that. You have a muscle uh, movement, our cerebellum, that's a different part of the brain for our lobe where, like we were talking about earlier, that you know, when you pick up a tennis racket, if you play tennis all your life, or, or even as a guitar player, like you mentioned, Ryan, when you pick up the guitar, you don't actually have to think, wait, do I hold it this way? How, how do I, you know, all of that is just natural when you pick it up, your, your hands, your body, your fingers, they all know what to do because your muscle memory is taking so that's housed in a different part of the brain, like running. You know, you don't have to actually think, do I move my leg this way in order to run, or what do I do now? Um, all of that, your, your muscle memory is just taking over, riding a bike, all of that is a different part of the brain. The, the cerebellum primarily controls that muscle movement. 
I was wondering also about like deja vu. Like what what is that? What's going on there? <laughs> That's very similar to the idea that <laughs> so you may see something familiar and you may think that you have that memory. You think that you've encoded that memory before. So you may see a rose and you might think um, that rose may remind you of a memory that you stored in your hippocampus, and so your brain says, Oh no, I was just here, I just stored this memory. And so it kind of creates a copy of that because you have something stored, you know, an image or a color or smell, all of that can trigger something from a long term memory. And your brain just thinks, Oh, I've been there before because it's triggering something in your long term memory that you remember that you stored in there. So it, it's probably not that you were in that spot before that happened before. It just, are you saying like it gets stored in your long-term and short-term memory at the same time? Or so it's happening in, in your long-term memory and your sensory memory, your senses are picking something up, whether it's that visual information, that sensory, you know, the smell, uh, maybe even the touch, maybe you touch a napkin and that triggers, you know, your grandmother's coat that you used to love snuggling it, you know, she wore or something. And that and you think, oh, I've been here before because that mm. touch and that sensation is triggering a memory that you stored. Um, it's, a, it's not something that scientists know a lot about, but that's one explanation that's often given. But it's still a very, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's hard to understand. There's a lot about the brain that we don't fully understand. We're still, we're still learning. I mean, uh, we, we were just talking about mental health just now. There's a, a new piece of research that just come out looking at um, ways in which we can, you know, that there may be different causes for depression. We were convinced that it was more, you know, your serotonin levels and a lot of the medication focuses on that. But there's other suggestions that, you know, there may be other neurotransmitters that are also involved. Um, recently, too, they just found that um, there may be something to help reverse the signs of the cognitive deficits associated with dementia and Alzheimer's. So working memory is one of the things that we lose when um, we experience dementia or Alzheimer's. And just recently, they found that there may be a way to actually not only prevent that, but actually reverse that from happening. Um, so we are still discovering lots of new things of how the brain is working. So deja vu is one of those still little, little understood uh, mysteries of the brain. And so what are you, um, I know there's a bunch of exercises in, in your um, book, The Working Memory Advantage, but I haven't, I haven't got to them yet. So like, what are some things that we can do? And is there, um, should I be doing something different? I'm, I'm 39. Should I, I be doing something different than um, somebody that's 60 or 20 or, or, or what can we do to make sure we're, because the working memory is what lets us access these different mm -hmm. parts. Like the memory is there, but we, we, might, not, we might not be able to like ac access it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a great way to put it, Ryan. Um, and I think that's what's so exciting about these studies that we talk about in the book is that um, whatever your age, regardless of your age, it's not too late to keep uh, strengthening your working memory and boosting your working memory. So we were talking about barefoot running. That is a great way to give yourself a quick boost. And I like to think of it on a continuum. So if you want to see immediate benefits to your working memory, here are some things you can do. Take up your shoes, Go for a quick run for 16 minutes and you will see an improvement to your working memory. Um, or another thing that you can do, again, you want to see an immediate effect to your working memory, do some natural movement, climb a tree, swing on some monkey bars at the playground, do some bear crawls around the, uh, the park or something. Those are some great ways that our studies have shown that you can actually improve working memory. Another thing that uh, I mentioned in the book that can immediately boost your working memory is if you like essential oils, there are studies to show that rosemary and um, peppermint both can actually improve working memory right away and that's because it improves something called acetylcholine which is known as a, a memory neuron a memory neurotransmitter um, and that inhaling right with essential oils even if you have a your diffuser or a little bit of a, a, a tissue in your pocket or so on that can be really beneficial to improving your working memory right away so those are three things you can do if you want to see immediate benefits to your working memory um, if you are in class or in a boring meeting and you're trying to stay focused and you find your attention kind of, you know, drifting away and you want to keep the working memory on task, another study that I love by a colleague of mine is um, she showed that doodling, uh, you know, just kind of drawing while you are doing a very boring task can help keep your working memory minimally focused on the task and make you more likely to remember. A tip that I give my students, um, if you, my college students, that if you are trying to study for an exam, there's countless research to show that studying just before bedtime 
helps consolidate your memory. So you're able to remember information for much longer and much better. So if you have to memorize you know, some tough bits of information, maybe for presentation or for meeting or so on, try to do it just before bed because you're more likely to let that sleep will help your brain consolidate and keep all the information inside. So there's just some quick tips if you want to see some immediate benefits. If you're more in it for the long term and you don't mind working up towards that, then there's a whole chapter on the kind of foods that research has found that can improve working memory. Things like blueberries, flavonoid and rich foods, essentially. So the, the richer the color in the food, the greener the vegetables, the bluer, the better the fruits are, the more likely the, the flavonoid count is higher, which studies have shown have been linked into improving working memory. So dark chocolate, 70% cocoa solids, researchers have found that that can improve working memory. Uh, blueberries, um, that has uh, rich in flavonoids, and that has also been found to but here you're looking to see benefits over a few weeks. So you, you have to do this for a few weeks before you can actually see improvements to your work. Yeah. Does that have, you were saying like just before bed, it like made me think of, um, um, I think it was like Thomas Edison or something like that. Like he would um, like hold a, like something in his hand and like he would like, once he started to like fall asleep, he would drop it that sound would like wake him up and then he would try to like create. But okay. is, is there something to that? Well, like you're like, so like studying just before bed and he was like just about to fall asleep and then that makes, and then he puts him in this creative space. Is, is it like a, a, like a brainwave thing or? So that goes back to what we were talking about with the creativity where we want to turn off our working memory. So if you're trying to wake yourself up just as you're really tired and your working memory is shut down for the night because you want that creative idea to come out, um, that's different from learning before bed. Learning, you don't want to wait till you're absolutely tired, but learning before bed, is, it's actually the sleep patterns that help consolidate what you're learning. But what you're describing with Thomas Edison is more the creative process where you're allowing your kind of self-expression to come out because you've toned down your working memory. Yeah, that's... Um... Um, like the working memory versus the IQ for success. Yeah. What's, what's that about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's a lot of my research. I've actually had you know, multiple government funded projects to look at school children specifically to see what if we can find the best predictor for academic success. And um, time and time again, I found that working memory is a much more powerful predictor of how children perform in school in reading and math and writing and so on. But the exciting thing for me is not just that it's such a great predictor, but it's also culture fair. So I like to think of working memory as leveling the playing field. So regardless of your, you know, your, your zip code, where you're coming from, your cultural background, we found that working memory, I've done studies with colleagues in South Africa, comparing them with, you know, monolingual, um, primarily white English speaking uh, uh, students and found that when it comes to working memory, there's no difference in how these students are performing. So very exciting to see that, you know, whether your mom read, you know, 10 books a night to you versus no books at all, your working memory isn't going to be negatively or positively affected by that. It's, it's relatively buffered by all of that. And it's a great measure of what you can actually do. It's like, it's sort of your potential to learn. And so uh, along those lines, I've been invited, uh, the New York City, the independent school system, they used to use IQ tests, traditional IQ tests, as high stakes testing, like the SAT or the GRE and so on. They would use IQ tests as their criteria for admission into these kind of competitive private schools, independent schools. And they began to come across my work and they asked me to talk about how working memory may be a better measure of a child's ability to succeed rather than an IQ test. And in fact, just yesterday in the news, um, University of Chicago is not going to require um, traditional type of IQ testing. Sorry, I'm uh, no battery here. Um, they're not going to require traditional types of IQ testing like the SAT or ACT as part of the college admission. So we're starting to see a shift where educators are beginning to realize that traditional knowledge-based tests like IQ and so on aren't really going to capture how well you will perform, whether you're in grade school or in college. Yeah, the, it's much better at capturing that. Yeah, I, I can see how it, how it would be. It does seem like colleges, or like or school in general, is is just different now, and it doesn't really prepare people for um, the life now. It's it's like an old model of, um, and it like 
more like for people to be like employees instead yeah. of like uh, to have your own business and like really understand way um, what what you can really like do with your life. It, it seems like it's more like the, this, this old style of um, school is it, it's like the, it, something needs to change because kids are graduating with tons of debt and they don't yeah. know what to do. And so if there's some other way of school that can like prepare them for, I mean, I don't know what all the answers are. It sounds like your, your way is makes a lot more sense than uh, like how we can actually create, you know, what it is that we want. Yeah. yeah. Just like memorizing this stuff and going through this way. So it would be nice to see these. My, my daughter is 20. Okay. And uh, so she like went to one college for like a month and that wasn't really for her. Now she's looking at like some different schools and, sure. and I'm thinking like, well, what is your investment? Are you, are you sure school, or this kind of school is a good investment? Yeah. You, and yeah. instead of like, maybe you should be thinking more like business stuff, not necessarily business school, but like maybe uh, courses or maybe a school too, but like maybe there is a different, uh, path than a yeah. uh, hundred thousand dollars worth of debt before yeah. you can start cashing in on that possibly yeah. so yeah. I guess it's a matter of like do you have like could you speak more on that or was that like a little bit outside of what you meant or no I mean that's one of the, the that's one of the studies too that we've been looking at and then other researchers have looked at that but part of working memory is this ability to plan so working memory is not just you know actively um getting information out of your brain, but it's also whether you can have a goal and create ways in which you accomplish that goal. And so goal identification is a really big part too of that and being able to use your working memory. So the advice you gave your daughter sounds fantastic. What is your goal? And then work backwards. And that's one of the things we talk about in the book. We've interviewed people like Susan Polgar, who's the first woman chess grandmaster. And it's really exciting when I spoke with her because that's exactly what she does. She says, what's my end goal? What do I want to get here? And then she works backwards and that makes it so much easier instead of trying to think, what do I need to do today? She can say, well, if I want to get here, I just have to kind of, you know, like finding a maze. You start from the inside and then work your way back out right the other way, it's a lot easier. And so that's one of the benefits of using working memory is you can use it to plan and say, here's my goal and I want to work backwards to get to that goal. What are the steps that I need to take to accomplish that goal? Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's really fascinating how it all, all works. It really seems like there's a, a real shift in like the consciousness and mm -hmm. and what's like how we're learning and what people are being drawn to. You're talking about like the natural movement mm -hmm. that seems to be getting <clears throat> more and more popular and, um, and you're talking like spatial awareness and yoga and like yoga is just exploding. And I mean, it's getting more and more popular all the time. And, and uh, like people are kind of like figuring out these different ways like I first got into um, personal training in 1999 right. um, and I was like about 20 years old mm -hmm. and it was just like a kind of a different world then and like what I was wanting to do was not really popular and uh, mm -hmm. and it's like stuff wasn't really new because like my at my uh, jujitsu school when I was 18 19 yeah. um, we did a lot of like animal movements, the warm up yeah. looked like yoga stuff. Yeah. And we're doing all these different things. And that was way before um, like the uh, Instagram and, and all this yeah. stuff. Now like it's just exploding more and more. So um, like what got you into the, the natural movement? Did you know about it? Like, and, and I was going to ask you like, what made you get into this? so fascinated with memory and decided to devote so much of your study towards memory. And like, what was the like beginning of both of those, the, the movement exploration and the, the memory ex study? Yeah, the memory exploration really was just, you know, part of my PhD. I, I was, when I was done with my PhD, I was offered a, a postdoctoral fellowship, a research position, and it was government funded. And a lot of that was focusing because working memory at the time, people were looking at it more from a clinical setting, from a patient perspective, and how 
you know, memories working from, from trauma, from patients, and no one was actually looking at its wider application. And so this was the first um, opportunity really to look at it first in an education setting. And the more I began talking about it, I would have people come up and tell me later, well, you know, I have children with ADHD, how does working memory work there? Or I work with children with motor difficulties, how does that work there? And it kind of grew that the more I talked about it, the more people wanted to see how it applied to what they were interested in. And um, when the national movement, as you mentioned, is, was starting to grow, and that was a lot of the kind of things that I enjoyed doing too, you know, running there for climbing trees. And I hadn't really thought of, you know, maybe working memory was also being improved from that. And so it was more just an interest. It was something that I enjoyed doing. And as much as people would come to me and say, hey, I work with, you know, these populations, how does working memory work? I thought, hey, how, what do I do in my life that I enjoy? I wonder how working memory is being affected too. And so that's kind of how it, it led to some of that piece of research. Yeah, you mentioned um, ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm in my charger, uh, Brian. Is that, I don't know how much longer you thought we might do this for. Or... Um, we can just start. To, we can start to wrap it up if you if you want. If your if your phone's about to die, if you need to yeah. get going, we can. So I just didn't want it to cut off, and you think that I, I ducked out on you. So. Oh no. Um, yeah, I could just ask if you want to just like end with the ADHD, or, or yeah. I can I can hit yeah. pause for a second if you if you need to. But um, we can we can start to wrap it up. We've been going about an hour, so. Okay. Um, if you could just like, so the ADHD is another one of those things that seems to be getting more um common and i wondered like how and it's being like medicated a lot there's a lot of medications that don't seem to be very healthy and mm -hmm. is there more natural solutions like these solutions that you've already been you've been talking about this whole time could that be better than you know these medications that people are taking Sure, I think one of the, the one of the exciting things, I just published a book um, a couple months ago. It's a clinical book looking at working memory in these kinds of developmental disorders, and ADHD is one of them. And I had a fantastic colleague contribute to that, and he, um, he was talking about how, well, we know that in ADHD, your motor cortex, the part of the brain that controls your movement, is overactive, and that's why they feel like they're always moving, they're always fidgeting, they have to do something uh, to kind of keep going. But what's happening is their prefrontal cortex, their working memory, is underactive. So you've got that, you know, overactive motor cortex, underactive working memory, and sometimes people call that a fast race car with the brakes. What he found is one of the great things that we can do even in the classroom, no medication, nothing, is to allow them to move. Because a lot of times what teachers will say, sit still, stop moving, stop fidgeting. And what that's doing is it's involving them to use their working memory to stop that kind of natural movement that they want to do, their body has to do. And as a result, they can't use their working memory to focus on the learning. And so he found when the children were allowed just to move around, some had those little, you know, those big uh, bouncing exercise balls, some had, uh, you know, uh, pedals under their desk, or whatever, something that allowed general movement, their working memory was so much better and they actually performed better in the classroom. Too. So that's a, a quick fix. And I know a lot of schools are actually starting to implement different things like standing desks. Some of them do have these big balls in the classroom to work with too, um, allowing the children to, to kind of work in a physical manner in which they are you know, which is better for how their brain actually works. So that's a, a great way to allow their working memory to be focused without having to worry about them controlling their movement all the time. Yeah, that would be really good. That's like too much, too many prescriptions, I think. <laughs> so um, I know your, your phone's about to die. Um, I really appreciate you coming on and um, you yeah, have open invitation to come on again. There's Thank like, you. like kind of pick your, pick your brain at it for, um, ever. So how can people uh, find out about what you're doing? Yeah, well, Brian, it was just such an honor to spend my afternoon talking to you, and I you know, really enjoyed it as well. It's a great conversation. If people like to find out more about my work, it's tracyalloway.com. It's tracyalloway.com. All my books are on there. They Okay, her phone died and she wanted me to go ahead and finish it up here. So you can check her out at uh, tracyalloway.com. You can see the book here if it doesn't have too much of a glare. And she has 
several other books that she's written and check her out on Instagram. And uh, if you want to get a hold of me about the show for any reason, you can do so at fitnessandconsciousness at gmail.com.